I'm going to start with a question, and I'm going to ask you to think about a thriving ecosystem. When we think about that, what comes to mind? I suspect that for many of you, a thriving ecosystem represents a rainforest in which there are lots of species of animals and insects and ferns and flowering plants beneath this dense canopy of trees. There may be others that have more of an ocean inclination. And when we think thriving ecosystem, we think of a beautiful coral reef filled with brightly colored fish and all sorts of exotic invertebrate species. Another great example of a thriving ecosystem is Mr. Littner's terrarium. He planted this 40 years ago, watered it once, and sealed it. And it has been in perfect balance ever since. But I'm a microbiologist. I love bacteria. And what I'm going to try and convince you of today is that probably the most important ecosystem that we as human beings need to think about is the vast community of microbes that live in association with us. Every surface, every cavity of the human body is colonized by this complex community of microbes. And we are now just beginning to apply the tools that came out of the genomics revolution to understand them. And what we're starting to learn is that they are critically important for our health and may also play important roles in diseases. So I think it's very safe to say that we are not alone. From the day that we're born, we live in close association with these microbes. The estimates are that each of us carries hundreds of trillions of microorganisms around with us every day of our lives. That means that there are 10 times the number of microbial cells as there are human cells associated with any individual. It really makes you pause and think, what does it mean to be human if only 10% of our cells are human cells? We can make some other estimates, and if we took all of, we were able to collect all of these microbes, they would probably weigh somewhere between three and five pounds and nearly fill a gallon jug. Those are interesting facts to throw around in casual conversation, but what's far more important <laughs> is the role that these microbes play in our health. We've actually known about the existence of these communities for almost 400 years. They were first described by Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who invented the microscope. And one of the first things he looked at was the material that he scraped from the surface of one of his teeth. And he wrote in a letter to the Royal Society of London about all the small animals that were swimming around in this substance from his mouth. Most of these microbes, though, we can't successfully grow in culture. And for most of the history of microbiology, if you couldn't grow a bacterial organism, you couldn't study it. But genomics has revolutionized that, and we are starting to learn a tremendous amount about our microbial partners. In 2008, out of the NIH came this very bold idea for what became known as the Human Microbiome Project. It was really a follow-on to the Human Genome Project. And the idea was to bring interested scientists together in an interdisciplinary way to study these microbial communities. This was a big project. It needed to be because the communities were so complex. And we estimate that these microbes that live in association with us contain more than 100 times the number of genes encoded in the human genome. So the project was really pretty simple. Go out and recruit 250 volunteers, an equal number of men and women, and have them agree to be swabbed and scraped and probed for two years' time to collect material that we could then use to better understand these microbial communities that live on our skin, in our mouth, in our GI tract, in our respiratory tract, in the human vagina. And this worked out extraordinarily well. And what we've learned is that our body is indeed a complex microbial ecosystem. It serves as a scaffold for all sorts of bacteria, thousands of species of bacteria and other organisms, archaea, fungi, single-cell parasites, viruses. And if you look across all of the environments that make up the human body, we see that there are unique combinations of microbes present in each location. 
And it really looks like we have co-evolved with our microbial partners so that the microbes that are present in any given place on our body are there to carry out specific and important tasks. We are each unique in the microbes that we carry. They represent yet another molecular fingerprint of us as individuals. There was a really cool study published a couple of years ago that collected microbes from the fingertips and also collected microbes from keys on computer keyboards. And without any exception, you could accurately map the owner of the keyboard back to the keyboard. That's how unique these signatures really are. So if thinking about these hundreds of trillions of microbes is starting to make you squirm, it shouldn't. Because these are beneficial microbes, they're critically important for health. In the early years of life, they are very important in educating our immune system to identify them as self and not see them as foreign invaders. In the GI tract, where I spend most of my time working, they harvest energy from all of the foods that we eat. We couldn't break down a lot of the plant polysaccharides that we eat, for example, if it wasn't for the microbes in our gut. They synthesize vitamins. They produce metabolites that nourish the cells that line the GI tract. And probably most important, in all environments on the human body, they protect us against infection with pathogens. The early stages of life, the first couple of years, are critically important. We are introduced to our microbes the day we're born. We get them from our mothers. And what we know is that babies that are born by C-section, and about a third of the deliveries in the US are by C-section, they get a very different inoculum of microbes than babies that are born through normal vaginal delivery. And these differences persist for many, many months of, of life. We also know that infants that are fed formula instead of breast milk end up with different complements of microbes. In fact, breast milk contains important microbes that need to colonize the GI tract of babies. And if that isn't interesting enough, breast milk also contains fructooligosaccharides that are there not to feed the babies, but to feed the microbes that live in the infant's GI tract. We've moved into cities. We've moved off of farms. Children have less contact with the natural environment, less contact with animals. That seems to matter. And most of all, probably most important, is the fact that many young children are given courses of antibiotics early in life. All of this together can lead to an altered microbial community composition in children. And this may predispose to certain illnesses later on in life that are related to changes in our microbiota. We don't need to look any further than this study that was published a couple of years ago comparing US infants to infants in Malawi or, or in a tribe of Amerindians in Venezuela. What you see on this figure here, each one of these points represents a fecal sample taken from a US baby and a gender and aged match control from a rural population. What's immediately apparent is that the US babies are different. And the microbiota that they harbor is characterized by much lower diversity, far fewer species than what you see in infants that grow up in rural environments. Why does this matter? Well, if you go back to fundamental principles of ecology, we know that high diversity ecosystems are more stable and more resilient. They're more apt to return to the healthy state if they are perturbed. So think about that. What might that mean? I think we all know that there has been a growing incidence of allergy, food allergy, asthma in children over the past several decades. This is just a figure that shows the increase in the number of doctor's visits for asthma in children up to age 17 over the past 25 years. There's been a fourfold increase. How does this relate to the microbiota? All of a sudden now we're talking about asthma? Well, studies in mice have shown that if you expose young mice to antibiotics, 
you can mimic the allergic phenotype that we see in humans. And when you look at the diversity of the microbiota in these young mice that have been exposed to antibiotics, they're lower diversity, they have fewer species than what you see in young mice that weren't exposed to antibiotics. And these differences seem to persist into adult life. This is data from that same study that I showed you, only now looking at adults in the U.S. compared to adults in rural populations. Again, we see this enormous difference. The communities are lower diversity, there are fewer microbes there, and we suspect that this may be something that we need to start paying attention to. Is there a reason for this? What's going on? Why are these communities so different? Well, we certainly know that our dietary habits have changed, and perhaps not for the better. We now have ready access to processed foods. It isn't so easy to always eat fresh fruits and vegetables, and that may matter. We also have reduced contact with natural environments. I don't think kids are out playing in the dirt like they used to be when I was growing up. And we know that it, there can be a danger in living in an environment that's too clean. This relates to what you may have heard, the hygiene hypothesis, that being sheltered from these microbes early in life may be a bad thing. We also use antibacterial products all the time, antibacterial soaps, antibacterial cleansers, the dispensers that you see now in every public building. Every time you take a squirt of that and rub it all over your skin, you're disrupting the natural microbial community that lives there. But probably most important is our overuse of antibiotics. Every time we take antibiotics, there is collateral damage. We target our beneficial bacteria. And my friend and colleague, Marty Blazer at NYU, has put all of this together and suggested that perhaps we are dealing with the disappearing microbiota hypothesis that we have unintentionally driven the evolution of our microbial communities to a situation that is less diverse and inherently less stable. A lot of the work that I do has begun to look at changes in our microbiota associated with various chronic diseases. I've been studying obesity, diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, other work has looked at cancer, and what we are seeing is a growing body of evidence to suggest very clear associations between changes in our microbiota and these different disease states. And I, I, I need to be careful at this point and make it clear that these are just associations at this point, but studies are underway to begin to address causality. And so this raises the intriguing possibility if diseases are associated with changes in the microbiota, can we think of that as a new therapeutic target and begin to consider ways to move this back towards a more healthy state? What can we do? Well, clearly we know that our microbiota is shaped to a great extent by what we eat. There has been a microbiota composition described that's associated with a high fat diet and it's radically different than what we see in individuals who eat a high fiber diet. I have to say, as excited as I am about this research, it's really kind of depressing because I don't eat donuts like I used to. I think that matters. <laughs> Probiotics may also be beneficial in maintaining the balance of our microbiota in certain conditions. There are a lot of claims out there. Probiotics are everywhere. But the interest in the microbiota has begun to spur new research to really carry out rigorous scientific trials to assess the efficacy of probiotics in treating various diseases. And I know I've said this before, but I don't think I can say it enough. We must guard against unnecessary antibiotic exposure whenever we can. There's also a brave new frontier to this field that has been around in the agricultural field for decades, but it's just starting to gain some traction in human studies, and that's the idea of fecal transplants. Taking fecal samples from healthy donors and giving those to recipients that are sick. This has been shown to have great efficacy in treating antibiotic-induced diarrhea. 
And this is a disease that can be fatal. In fact, many thousand people a year die from antibiotic-induced diarrhea. The best treatment seems to be transfer of fecal material from a healthy donor into the recipient. The cure rate has been reported to be as high as 95%. This has a real ick factor, I know. I teach this to medical <laughs> students every year. But interestingly, there has been some work that's already been started to see if we can identify the most important species in our GI tract and formulate those in a way that perhaps is more acceptable and more accessible. The idea that we could come up with brand new formulations of probiotics that you could take in capsule form, repopulating the gut <laughs> when necessary. This is my last slide, um, and I will say right at the outset, I am not involved in this project other than as an enthusiastic recent participant. This represents science through crowdsourcing. It's the American Gut Project. You can Google this and find it. And for $99, you can get a kit in the mail where you can basically poop into a cup, <laughs> send your sample back in from yourself, your partner, your children, your best friend, even your dog. And what you will get back is information about the diversity of your gut microbiota compared to everybody else in the US. And the idea is to eventually take this global. The holidays are coming. I can't think of a better way <laughs> to tell people that you love them. But in, but in all seriousness, if you are interested, if you want to see where you are currently, if you want to see how diet changes the composition of your microbiota, you don't have to wait until this makes its way into doctor's offices. Not only will you find out more about who you are, but you will also be contributing to moving this really exciting field of science forward. Thank you. <laughs>